It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Black Progen Live. Black Progen. Black Progen Live. Welcome to Black Progen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets. Black Pro Gen. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Alito Chimachukma. The unapologetic black and people of color viewpoint. Genealogy, family history research with flavor. Hello. How are you? Welcome to Black Pro Gen Live. Today's episode, episode 110, we're going to be talking about a very probably underutilized record set in genealogy. What's the difference between circuit and chance record? Are probate and succession the same thing? Why bother looking at court records when it's not involving slavery? Get the answers to these questions and more during today's episode where we'll cover court records from top to bottom. Thanks so much for joining us for episode 110, Court Records for People of Color Genealogy Research, airing live today, April 28th, the longest April in recorded history. I'm sure True probably has something to say about that because this is her birthday month, but literally it has been 575 days this April, and I'm sure you all can probably sympathize (laughs) with my sentiments about how long April has been. Be sure to subscribe to Who is Nika Smith on YouTube so you get every single thing Black Pro Gen Live related and more. Also, be sure to join us on Twitter at Black Pro Gen. We have covered, we actually are almost at 2,100 followers on it's on uh, Facebook. Or actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting all my social media stuff confused. We're almost to 2,100 people on Twitter. Um, and we just cracked 5,000 subscribers here on YouTube. Um, that happened last week. I think mean, it was unceremonious. I'm actually kind of sad because I almost wanted, you know how Google sends you stuff? Like, oh, did you know? It's been five days since you responded to this email the last time, right? Why didn't I get that for 5,000 subscribers on YouTube? Maybe I need to write somebody. I don't know who I'm supposed to be writing. Anyway, be also sure to uh, like us on Facebook as well at Black Pro Gen Live. We share a lot of different content things, news stories, all sorts of stuff. If you've been following the Roots and Chill initiative to help flatten the curve when it comes to COVID-19 and coronavirus, you have found a thread there weekly that gives you prompts and things to focus on. So you stay your tail in the house and you aren't out in the streets potentially getting sick. So that is stuff that you can find on our social media channels. Also, have you missed our newest series, History Unscripted? It features your favorite panelists and a guest as we discuss discuss pop culture and current events from a genealogy and family history perspective. We've already got five episodes up. Did you know that? We do. One is featuring chef Annette King. Another is featuring youth development icon Regina Jackson. Consultant and coach Gingy Heiston is on the next. And the most recent, which was filmed last week and posted last week, brings you the story of three people who discovered their fathers were not who they were told they were through DNA. Head to the Who is Nika Smith YouTube channel to check check them all out. Remember, History Unscripted is not live like today's episode. It is pre-recorded. All right. We've got a lot of folks in the chat room who have joined us. Thank you so much, folks from Orlando, Florida. Uh, we've got people here from New Jersey. Um, Teresa is in the chat room. She wants to know how everyone is surviving quarantine. Might want to check in and ask about that. Shelly, Dr. Shelly Murphy's in the chat room. Hello, panelists and one of the aunties here on Black Pro Gen Life, along with Angela Walton Raji, Trisha Blount, Down to Earth. Hello. How are you? Muriel Roberts is joining us from Jersey City, New Jersey. And um, Dante Eubanks is here, Cecilia Matoya Charles. Thank you guys so much for joining us this afternoon. All right, how is the panel? We've got four beautiful, beautiful women here wearing glasses. Let me put mine on so I don't feel deficient. That way I'm matching everyone. How are all of you? Doing fine. Yeah. (laughs) In spite of going anywhere, can't do anything. Girl, I know. That's in spite right. of. Staying, staying healthy, staying yes. safe. Yes. Washing the hands. Yes. Or as the old folks say, wash. You are <laughs> wearing my mask. <laughs> okay. Look, I'm telling you, what's going on? What's going on in Fort Knox, Chuan? Ch- 
We doing good. Mr. Washed his mask and it's out on the table um, drying and it did so well on the delicate cycle. So I did want to tell you that he finally, you know, did his little thing, but we're doing good hanging out, um, you know, just snacking. He actually grilled this afternoon for lunch. So we'll, we'll be good till tomorrow and just hanging out. Yes, <laughs> Ellen, what's going on? Have we added 25 more books to the bookshelf behind you? No, it seems like I get like more PDF books now than actually hardcover books. So <laughs> you can't see what's exploding lately. <laughs> yes, yes. Same here, same here. My bookshelf is kind of, it's, it's, I've inherited books. For some reason, I keep getting like 600 page books right now. I don't know why I keep oh. organic books. And I'm like, ooh, this bookshelf, I'm already out of it. I need another one. So, um, so yeah, so I feel you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Of course, as we get started with the episode, we've got to remind you about previous episodes that feed into this one. Uh, we want to call attention to episode 51, Finding and Tracing Enslaved Ancestors. Of course, that is related because we're talking about court records. In particular, you're looking at probates or successions in our Napoleonic terms and New Orleans <laughs> to steal to sort of steal or hijack the term Bernice just used, but that is true. We say succession, we don't say probate, um, and we say parish, we don't say county. Just that's just how we do things. Um, so, so yeah, so that uh, episode definitely feeds into this one talking about court records as well. Episode seventy five, getting the most from your research trip. Now you're probably thinking we can't go anywhere, so why in the world would I plan for a research trip? Well, actually, this is the best time to plan for a research trip because you're not rushed. You're not. You don't have this date looming over your head like, oh, you know. I got to get on the plane in two weeks and I haven't done anything. We'll actually plan for when you can get on the plane. This is a perfect time to do that. So check out episode 75, getting the most from your research trip. Also episode 69, biology of a document from analysis to plan. That is our long title for Shelly's show. So what <laughs> um, sort of thing that she does being able to analyze documents, right? That's going to come into play with a lot of what we talk about during this episode with regard to court records. And then we also have a state specific playlist that is all the shows we've done that are on particular states. Typically we batch them. So we'll do North and South Carolina, Louisiana and Mississippi. We also have some shows that we've done where, you know, it's one state because we forgot like Tennessee, even though I live here, that actually happened. Um, we, where it's a one-off sort of, but most of the times they're batched because the history, a lot of times is very similar or it runs um, sort of together. It's kind of, it's juntos. That's the, that's the word I'm, that's coming to my mind is very juntos history. Uh, so let's get started with the content. First question I have for the panel is what are court records? Because I think people, automatically think court and they think only probate, right? Like people get very, you know, shoo, you know, they automatically think court probate, that's for white slaveholders, nobody else. Let's talk about what, what exactly counts as a court record? Adoption, um, lawsuits. Divorces. Divorces, right, name changes. Um, Guardianship. You know, contract disputes, uh, land transactions. I agree. And, you know, that it's interesting. Um, I, I kind of have to give this shout out in the chat room because we got to celebrate for a second. One of our viewers found their third, second and second great grandmother and second great grandfather in the Freedmen's Bureau. And I would like to believe that it was because we led them there. I need some confirmation in the chat room, but I just had to put that out there because I missed that as a comment. Continue the conversation. We were talking about adoptions, divorces, uh, civil court cases, lawsuits, what else? We, we already know about probates and successions, right? Estates when people die, apportioning their, their property um, and assets to the living descendants. Uh, guardianship is another one. So let's say a child has both parents that have passed away or they're incapacitated. They become a ward, right? Or they have a guardian that will then make sure that they are taking care of their fiduciary responsibilities. Look at me in all my big words today. Um, <laughs> that they have land, that the taxes are being paid, right? That if there's a renter, that the renter or the leasee is paying, right? The rent on that land. There's a lot of different reasons why court records even include criminal stuff, right? Of course. Yes. I've, mm -hmm. I've seen at the courthouse, I cracked up laughing. I said, oh, Lord, Uncle Joseph got a criminal court record. And I pulled, and it was a speeding ticket. 
Even that, I mean, but some people would say, well, why are you looking up speeding tickets? Let's say I didn't know if he was where he was supposed to be and I needed to peg him at a particular point at a particular time. That tells me he was driving through this area. He most likely lived here during that time span. And that's a matter of public record. Any other things you guys can think about that are court records that most folks don't, don't consider to be a court record? Well, I, I mentioned name changes. I mean, that's a court record. You you mm -hmm. have to go through a legal transaction to get your name changed. You can't just wake up and say, I don't want that name today. No, you have to go and take care of some paperwork at mm -hmm. the courthouse. Mm -hmm. And I, I that actually, too, will help. I've had several family members that have changed their names. And people have different reasons for why they do it and why they don't do it. But that your your point is 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 exactly right. Uh, filing a legal name change. Anything else you guys can think of? We talked about adoptions, wills, wills. wills. challenges to the wills. Yeah, that's another set of documents. Um, if your ancestor served on a jury, there's documentation that they were a juror, right? At mm -hmm. least in Louisiana, they would select a grand jury or a list of qualified jurors that they would pick. So whenever they would convene it, those folks would get selected. A lot of times the people had to be, the men had to be literate. Um, and so sometimes you'll find those things in the newspaper. It'll say so-and-so was selected amongst, you know, the qualified jurors of the parish. Um, so that's, that's another set of records. Um, ch chat, chat room emancipations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. People being Absolutely. set free. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely another good one. Um, people talked about uh, there's a question with tax reports and marriage licenses. I found my great great grandfather's tax record as a freedman. Technically, not so much. That's more like a tax assessor, which is a office that operates within the courthouse. But it's, it, you know, they don't there's not a uh, there's not a court judge that says, you know, I'm the tax man. Right. Like the assessor assesses the taxes. If somebody's deficient on taxes and their land has to be sold for back taxes, then that has to go through the court because then there's like a process. They have to post that, the, you know, that there's a delinquency in taxes a certain amount of times in the newspaper is going to be sold on the courthouse steps, then then that would enter the court process, right? Mm -hmm. In some jurisdictions, marriage licenses are technically a part of the chancery court, right? I believe that's what it is. I always get chancery and circuit confused, <laughs> which is why I have because in Louisiana, how many clerks we got, Bernice? I just know about the circuit, the clerk of court. <laughs> exactly. We got uno. <laughs> one. We don't you have one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You go to one place, you're like, hey, girl, you got everything, right? No. Tennessee got like seven. I don't appreciate it. Okay. Especially research wise, because no lie, you guys, I did some on site research for a client and, and they were trying to find out who owned this one piece of land that, that had a cemetery on it, like who was paying the taxes for it or had it been exempted. And so I'm in one office looking at deeds and my natural Louisiana research. And so I'm like, okay, so let me just go across the hall, you know, across the, 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 the doorway and go look at the, <laughs> go look at the tax records. They're like, oh, you got to go upstairs for that. What you mean I got to go upstairs? All that's supposed to be in one spot. Not in Tennessee, not in a lot of other states. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so chat, chat room, some uh, uh, Renata uh, chimed in, bastardy bonds in addition to the stuff she mentioned above. Um, legal name change, criminal court case records, apprenticeships, guardianships. I would even say labor contracts because mm -hmm. it's a contract, right? Also something we're not thinking about is articles of incorporation for a business or an entity, right? So that could be a church, that could be a business enterprise, right? So when you enter into an incorporation, there's documents. And when you dissolve it, there are documents that are associated with that. Um, same thing with a church, right? Or, or maybe someone gave land to a church or maybe someone sued the church because I've seen that. <laughs> That that a lot now. Yeah, that happened on a Paul Not Paul situation where the, the pastor wanted to change the direction of the church and the trustees didn't. So the pastor, saw, he, he sued all the trustees and the associated people. I was like, yikes. Um, but that was a court record. I'm just going to scroll back through. I think we pretty much covered everything. That's the thing. It depends on the office for which the records are held, right? Because some of the folks that folks are talking about or things that people are talking about are like indentures, right? Yes, that is held in the clerk of court's office, but the actual indenture or the conveyance, right, of property from one person to the next, that a judge doesn't oversee that. The clerk does, right? So 
depending that, that that stuff could be inside of a court record but by and large most for the most part unless somebody is suing somebody else that's just indeed books. It's in conveyance books. Um, True, you have anything to add before I move to the next question? No? Okay. She said, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> um, and so why should we even bother looking through things like this? Like, what's the point, right? Because I mean, we're, you know, we're trying to find a slave owner. I mean, why do I care about a probate from 1922? Because slavery was over. Because it has nothing to do with slavery. It has something to do with the documents that you can find on your ancestors. And it doesn't matter at what point you can find those documents. The point that you want to find is that, wait a minute, my ancestors interacted in some way with the court system. And so if, you, if it means you're going to look in slavery at, during slavery time or post-slavery, you still need to think my ancestors interacted with the court system. Something happened, you wanna find it. And it's not just one point in time, it's many points in time that you should be examining records and information to see where your ancestors are and who they're interacting with. Exactly, and there's a comment in the chat room or question in the chat room, shouldn't there be court records of children taken away from their parents and made wards of the state? Absolutely, um, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a set of records we didn't even talk about was family relations uh, court, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where people get divorced, we talked about divorces, but now in the kind of social or family, familial construct we have right now, you know, we have a lot of, sometimes a lot of people that, you know, choose not to get married and they have children. And so there will be custody agreements. That's right. There will be, um, you know, issues of uh, the judge may issue arrears for child support, back child support. That Those are public records. Um, even when people, they, people lose their parental rights and their children go into the foster care system, which is the quite really the question that they're asking. Yes, those records will be um, will be available, right? You'll, you may not see the children's names, but you'll see that an, an adult person or a person who could have had children lost parental rights for a child. And a lot of this depends on access, depends on what state you're in and what they allow people to see and not to, you know, not to see. Um, Just yeah, what time period you're talking about too. Oh no. The further it, back you go, it's there's yeah. there's more likelihood of informal relationships and you can't do really do that anymore. Exactly. But now because we're more litigious in, in mm -hmm. how we live, um, you know, it, for me, I mean, I'll, I'll go on record in saying this. I, I think I talked about this during the, uh, reverse DNA or re reverse genealogy and finding living people. That's one of the easiest ways that I find living people and children for folks that I didn't know they had is looking at public records. Mm -hmm. Was there a family law case that exists for this particular person? And I'll caution y'all, come close. Sometimes you might find some kids you ain't supposed to know about. <laughs> Just put that out there. So it is public record. So you got to be, you got to be careful with that. Um, so, so I think Bernice brings up a very important point though. Don't put this, these blinders up or this wall up thinking that, oh, well, we didn't have anything. So we didn't interact with the court system at all. Like that's being very short-sighted, right? Your family may not have owned land. They may not, you know, you might just think they just were dropped into this little one horse town. They were only there for a certain amount of time. It, we were, we're very short-sighted when we don't think to search every place, right? And here's the thing. When you sort of discount that your family had involvement with the court, you're pretty much saying they didn't have no sense. Like, really? Do you really think they weren't going to fight for their rights or like advocate for themselves? Like, how can we be that short-sighted, right? And if you search and you didn't find anything, then maybe they didn't have anything they had to deal with. But just to completely put a wall up, like before you even start is kind of problematic in my opinion. Um, so I just want to cover uh, just briefly before we go into how to access records and also give you all some examples of what some of this stuff looks like that's not probate or successions from a slave owner. Um, because I think even us on this show, we focused a lot on probates and successions for slave owners, but it was really because we want you to find your enslaved ancestors. But now we're telling you that's not the only probates and successions you might find. Right. Um, so uh, systems and, and organization in terms of all of this stuff varies by state, right? So you've got to know how the state you're researching is separated. I highly suggest that you do stuff like look for uh, the, the judiciary website for your particular state. Um, True can put the link in the chat room for um, an example from Mississippi that breaks down which, which court 
you know, has and which clerk has which set of documents. And in that way, that'll help you understand, okay, well, who is the justice of the peace? How, what do they have to do with the clerk, right? Is there a difference between the two? Do they still have them? Um, are some of the roles that are mentioned in some of the court documents, are they like non-existent anymore? You'll only learn that if you look at the, you know, the, the listing of laws, you know, in different roles and the descriptions for those people historically, along with, um, you know, with how the state is organized. And so Chancery Court is, uh, they have jurisdiction over disputes and matters involving equity. So if you hear Chancery, think equity, okay? And this is domestic matters, including adoptions, custody disputes, and divorces, guardianships, sanity hearings. That's something we left out, right? Deeming whether or not somebody is considered sane or has mental, you know, has mental difficulties, right? I've seen an interdiction. Here we go back to Louisiana and our words. <laughs> I have a copy of an interdiction for my great uncle, his wife. All I knew was my grandmother said, Aunt Angeline went crazy. That's all we heard. And I found where they, they had an interdiction for her and the judge deemed her to be mentally deficient and she was sent downstate to Jackson. Or at least that's how we said it in North Louisiana. She got sent down to Jackson. If you were, if you were in New Orleans, you got sent up to Jackson. Oh. <laughs> so poor Aunt Angeline, she, and she died there. You know, um, she died at the state mental hospital. So that's something else. Um, then, you know, I, I talk about stinky J.W. Allen, my, my great, great grandfather. He had an interdiction take place too, where they determined him mentally unsound. I did not find that in court records. I found that in the newspaper of the transcription of what had happened in the court that day, right? So it may be that you might locate court records that aren't in the actual court records. They may be in a newspaper or something else. So to continue with Chancery Court, um, so we talked about sanity hearings, wills, and challenges to constitutionality of state laws. Land records are filed in Chancery Court. Remember equity, right? The chancellor um, may appoint a lawyer in private practice to sit as a youth court referee to hear juvenile matters such as delinquency, abuse, and neglect. Trials are typically heard by a chancellor without a jury, although state law allows parties to request a jury in a Chancery Court. So this is, this is based on what Mississippi is saying. This is their definition of what they do. You need to find what your state um, that you're researching does. For circuit court, circuit courts hear felony, criminal prosecutions, and civil lawsuits, right? So typically we hear equity, we're like, well, that means there's a lawsuit. Well, in the state of Mississippi, no, right? A civil lawsuit goes to circuit court. It does not go to chancery, which is equity. Circuit courts hear appeals from county justice and municipal courts and from administrative boards and commissions such as Workers' Compensation Commission and the Mississippi Department of Employment Security. There are 22 circuit court districts and 57 circuit court judges. Now, here's the thing. Now we've gone from a clerk to a district, Right? So that means separate records. If you don't know where your ancestral location falls in terms of where a district is, you might be missing records because you may think, oh, well, my folks only lived here, but then you're not thinking about the judi judicial district, which those records are kept in a completely separate courthouse in a county that you aren't researching. Right? So keep that in mind as well. Um, the uh, the number of circuit court judges per district ranges from one to four. Circuit court judges are selected in nonpartisan elections to serve four-year terms. Trials are heard with a 12-member jury and usually one or two alternate jurors. A judge may preside without a jury if the dispute is a question of law rather than fact. So that's just Mississippi. That was all that was on their judiciary website. And I thought that was very helpful as a researcher because if we don't know, right? Like, luckily, I've been lucky. My district courts just hit, so happen to be the same parish my family lives in. But that might not be where you're doing research. Anything you guys would like to chime in and add about, you know, just the separation and how stuff is kept court rise? Well, I spent most of my time at the clerk of court in St. Helena and Livingston Parish. And both of those courthouses, uh, had documents that I could easily go in and talk about marriage records, land transactions, uh, secession records, um, uh, lawsuits. I mean, anything that I wanted, I went to one place. And that one place was able to direct me to where I could find the documents I was looking for. Uh, 
not to mention the fact that they had huge deed books and huge uh, uh, slave transaction books in there where there would be sales and family meetings because this is Louisiana. So they, of course, had to have family meetings and all of this was filed in the court. So uh, it just depends on where you're looking. In uh, South Carolina, Edgeville, which is where my paternal ancestors are from, I also found large number of court documents. And so again, it depends on where you're going, what you will find. So I think you're right to direct people to the website where those uh, courts are located so that you can learn exactly what's available at the courthouse. I agree. And I think um, the other thing, when you're talking about family meetings, you know, you know our, Lex, our lingo is, <laughs> it's like we just I know Ellen I'm sorry because me and Bernice are like we're talking in Louisiana right now you're like this is Louisiana family meeting what do you mean so let's talk about what that is family meeting is let's say like I got a good one I, don't you love when you get a good family meeting I love yeah. files <laughs> where it's hey it's hard to pay yeah somebody didn't die and I'm coming on record I got one Oh Lord, this girl, she, her father died and she, she swore she was the only child. Okay. I'm his only heir. She marched her little tail up in that courthouse. And then here come a baby. Like this woman was married. She was married age. She was in her early twenties. She thought she was Williamson Lyles' only surviving heir, even though he had married some woman in Kentucky. And so she marched herself up in that court in, in Louisiana and she was like, yes, I'm the only heir, blah, blah, blah. And then like literally two paragraphs down, here come the wife with like a <laughs> six-month-old baby. I said, oh, so I'm reading the file and I'm like, oh, it's about to go down. We about to have a family meeting because you you know the, the immediately when you see somebody, you know, so-and-so's countering with a blah, blah, blah. So I was like, oh, okay, okay. So what's going to happen? So that six-month-old baby, honey, they, they wore little Sarah out, okay, her mama. Cause they brought her, I promise they had about five or six meetings before they convinced her to sell her, her, uh, the baby's interest to the son-in-law. They wore her down. Like they literally wore her down. Um, and you can see it cause it says a family meeting was convened on blah, blah, blah. And there might be no conclusion, but they'll just tell you that a family meeting was had. Um, and so typically you'll see that in disputes, um, unless, you know, you might have that, that smart person who, uh, who put in the will, if you contend this, you get nothing. I've seen that too. Well, I've also seen uh, I've also seen uh, several different people showing up, and the court deeming that all of the people were legitimate heirs, and they had to then put a mediator in the middle of it, yeah, so that they could at least facilitate this conversation with all of these people. Just as you mentioned, they wore her down. Well, you see that happening in the records. What happened? Because they're writing everything that you're saying. Mm -hmm. everything and everybody has to sign off on on a piece of paper so it gives you a really good paper trail of what happened why it happened and what they agreed to Ellen what were you going to add in I just wanted to ask what's like the longest kind of time period that you've seen for some of those cases I know Ooh. some things can drag out I mean I've seen probate drag out a decade but over a decade but you know I've seen that when, when, yeah, when they can't wear the woman down and she's like, look, I don't care what you said. If I'm a woman or not, this is my property. Y'all ain't going to come and try and get it. And you ain't going to pay me under the value. And I've seen it drag out and, and I've seen it get ugly. I think I talked about that last week where one of the slave owners, they put all her baby daddy business on the street and it is in a Google book where it laid out where <laughs> she had these two babies by this one man and she wasn't married to him. And I'm like, what does that have to do with the estate? Y'all be petty. <laughs> But I was living for all of it because they were slave owners. I know I'm just that petty, but still. Well, you know, Ellen, I want to just mention to you that one of my ancestors passed away in 1909. Mm -hmm. Guess when everything was settled? In 1965. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I, I, I had to track all of this to 1965 and mm -hmm. found, found that the heirs were sued in 1965. Wow. Doesn't That's a lot of paper. Me. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. What, well, what, what were you going to add, True? I was just going to say with Alabama, it was it was a lot of trial and error for me getting my court documents. Um, one of them was a 1881 divorce decree, but it was in Chancery Court. And I can't remember the da- the names by heart, but if you look at Family Search Wiki or go to the ACIS, which is another website that Alabama uses for their court system, it'll tell you the years that it goes to chancery and then to, or, and then it'll start working its way itself into the, uh, the probate in the county courthouse because you have to utilize that. And then the other court case I had was an appeal to the Supreme Court of Alabama when my uncles, remember he was one of the three Negroes that got electrocuted in the state of Alabama. And what had happened was I had saw the box file inside the local Union Springs courthouse where all this happened, but then it had went to the Supreme Court because he had left the state, he had to get extradited back. And this was all in 1929, 1930. Mm-hmm. So I had to go through a lot of um, emailing back and forth to the archives plus once I left Bullitt County Courthouse I ended up at the archives in Alabama in Montgomery and then that's what led me over to the the Supreme Court of Alabama to get the actual case and everything for the Court of Appeals the judgment the indictment the order of court for arraignment um, all of that came and I did this all by email and um, you know ordering it that way so that was one case I had Um, And the same thing went on with the chancery case in Alabama. I started at the local courthouse because you have to know the dates and then you can go to the archives and then figure out what happened there because they'll record all where else it went. If it went to another state or if it stayed in within Alabama, what court system you have to use to, to get this type of thing. And with this is my grandfather was forced to marry um, a lady and she was already pregnant And he wanted a divorce because he knew that that baby wasn't his, but the father of the grandfather, the the father of the mother, you know, forced uh, Papa George, which is like my great grand great great grandfather to to marry this lady and look at how these are 11 by 18 and how many pages I've had to go through to get all the information and there were other names about people that were involved that were, you know, setting him up to to do all of this. And then I find out that Hannibal Hooks is one of my other relatives. Like, why would you do your cousin like that? Mm -hmm. And then it just led to a whole bunch of other mess, but it taught me how to use the system in Alabama, which wasn't really hard, but I had to dive into it and just to learn and to get into that groove of how do I, I do these court records. And it's the same thing when we did with Hathi Trust with our our family members, yours and mine, when they were, you know, snuck into the middle of the night in Montgomery to testify. And George Wallace wasn't even the governor then. And all the things I had to go through at Bullitt County which still led me back to Ada, which is the Alabama's Department of Archives. And then they would tell you, show you where else you need to go in these different counties or if it went to the Supreme Court in Alabama and whatnot. So yeah, I think you you raise an important point though that is also couched into this conversation. So don't assume that your ancestors were not involved with the court, but mm-hmm. also you need to check multiple jurisdictions, right. especially if you know, um, and this is especially true for the slavery era stuff, if the family came from one location and then moved down south, right? Like uh, Ellen sort of hit on that uh, with Roots and Chill maybe a couple weeks ago where you were talking about the folks being in South Carolina and then they were ended up in, in Florida, right? Mm-hmm. You know, slaveholders were Georgia. They were in Georgia. Then they moved to Mississippi. They might not have sold all that property that's in uh, Mississippi. I've researched slaveholders where they have plantations in multiple locations and each each location has a different probate. Right, a family cemetery mm-hmm. with my mom, even on her European sign, all that stuff went into the court just because they were getting a plot for the family inside of a cemetery. So it's all kinds of, things you just can't leave anything out because yeah there's no stone unturned because there's a paper trail there they left their their footprints there to, for you to get yeah i would i i would say seriously if you have a pretty expansive person who owns land in multiple locations you need to check that courthouse and not just the property deed records you need to check the court records there because i've seen like i said every county has a different probate case and i've seen situations where 
I pulled the original inventory for the property in Mississippi. And when I went to the archives, it was like, just imagine if I took a piece of paper and balled it up and then handed it to the person to microfilm it. And I was like, I cannot make out any of these names. But luckily the folks in one of the other counties copied down all the other enslaved people and the other inventories at their courthouse. So it was almost like, hey, here's where the main stuff is, but we're gonna have our own copy. And the, and the copy was pristine, the handwriting was great. So don't assume, right, that it might just be the property that was in that one county. Sometimes people would recopy documents so if they had, you know, the, the clerks will recopy documents. So they had a copy of it too. So I, I would, I would also put that, um, I will put that out there. Um, so where can we access court records? True brought up, um, you know, she talked about how she started at the local level. She went to the local courthouse and then eventually ended up at the Alabama Department of Archives. But some of this stuff isn't, aren't all the court records online? <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you sure? Everything's because online. there are <laughs> millions, there are millions of court records that are on Ancestry and every name is indexed. And same thing on Family Search. Every name is, and you can just type it in and it'll come right up. And you finished your tree too. I wish. <laughs> yeah. Not the yeah. case. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would say I would say the primary means that a lot of people, especially right now, because we can't travel, right? You're going to be looking, um, especially at probate records, wills and probates, um, and don't just think because it says probate that it's an actual probate. We talked about this last week during Roots and Chill. Just because it's in a probate book does not mean that the person is dead, or that has something to do with the estate, right? Remember, equity, making sure, right, that that we talk, Remember, we talked about the kids. Right. Even I had to flip my thinking on this because I was finding 10 year old kids in probate cases. And I'm like, they didn't die. <laughs> they didn't die till like 50, 60 years later. Right. So keep that in mind. Right. So I would say primary means family search catalog. If you don't know what we're talking about, God bless you. You need to get you need to get with the program. Um, in fact, I think we covered this on a Roots and Chill maybe a couple of weeks ago, where we showed everyone how to get into the Family Search catalog. But I would say that's a great that's a great uh, tool. But here's the problem: some of the records are locked, and you can't get access to them unless you're in a Family History Center, which of course those aren't open right now. So you know, by and large, that's probably the largest repository where multiple states information or multiple municipalities information is there. But don't, you know, you don't know until you, until you look like Mississippi, pretty much the whole state is wide open for court records where you can find them. Louisiana, sorry, you got to be in Salt Lake or you got to be at a family history center. Um, any other places? I, I mentioned the wills and probates records that are on Ancestry, but those are wills and probates. But don't assume the person is dead if you find their names in there. What other, what other uh, places would you guys suggest in terms of where, where can we, where can we I mean, find them? Even in archives. Mm -hmm. state archives and and local archives for example edgefield south carolina the courthouse did not burn they do have an archives with all the original documents so think about that go to your local archives there may be an office where they're keeping all of those old documents Agree, Ellen, where were you going to? I just wanted to say that even like federal records, some of these things have been published and you can access them on Google Books even. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's, right. there's Ooh, several yeah. different ways that you can, you can try. Oh yeah, things. look, Google Books, honey, that, how do you think I know about uh, <laughs> Nanette and her baby daddies? It's because the state, because the court went to the, the, the case went to the court, the, the, the state uh, Supreme Court. Supreme Court, yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. they have those, you know, because that's the thing people think, oh, well, you know, they just emailed the briefs over in 1775. No, there was no email. So they had to put together a book so that all the lawyers in the state knew, okay, this is what the case law is. This is what was what was selected, right? You know how we get the word out? Like, what was it yesterday? They decided on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Obamacare uh, stuff, you know, Sotomayor wrote the majority opinion. We could all pull that up on our phones. Well, they didn't have that. So they had to put out a book yearly that said, these were the cases that were decided. Here's how the case law has changed. So look, I, I can, I found so many states that have those digests of cases on Google books, like mm -hmm. literally just search like Louisiana and slave. And when you see Louisiana Supreme court as the author, mm -hmm. that will tell you that that was a case that was decided at the Supreme Court and not just not just the state level Supreme Court, Supreme Court cases. You'll find 
sites where, you know, they'll transcribe all the different stuff and they'll talk about it went here and went there. It'll kind of give you guidance. Um, something else I think people are super short-sighted about, and we talked about this on the reverse genealogy episode, people don't even look to see if a county has a website. Like, as in the one that you're sitting in right now? Right. Alabama mm-hmm. has them all over the place. You've got to look through that county yeah, yeah. courthouse before you go up to the archives and then go over across the street to the the Supreme Court or whatever. You know, they have other courthouses there, but I ordered all that online. Well, that, um, and that's that's the point that I'm making is most a lot of people don't realize what these county clerks are being able to do. They're being a, they're getting grants from organizations to digitize their records. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. In order for them to modernize. So you like take, for instance, Kansas City, Missouri, you can go on their website right now and pull current marriage licenses. Did you know that? You can pull current deeds. Did you know there's no fee associated with this? Most major metropolitan areas go to literally, you know, act like you are a citizen, act like you are a resident. Cause usually that's how they have the site separated for visitors, for residents, for whatever, right? Look at the circuit clerk, look at the chancery clerk, look at the clerk of court. They usually will have a link that says online records. <gasps> really? Oh my goodness. Yes, they've gotten, they've gotten grants to do all this stuff. And sometimes there is a fee associated like Cato Parish in Louisiana, Shreveport. They've been online for years. Um, And I'm talking going all the way back to their earliest records. Now, granted, you're gonna have to spend $200 a month to get access to it. But if you're hard up and you're dealing with a coronavirus, you might wanna split that money up between maybe four or five people. So you don't have to pay it by yourself and give other people access. Now, granted, that's probably violating their terms of service, but still I'm trying to help the people. And remember when we did that Hathi Trust Us, it was behind the thing. We used to have to probably was going to pay for that. And remember it was online. Those 382 pages from Father Hesburgh talking to my cousin Aaron in that courtroom. And they transcribed every question and word for word what cousin Aaron said. Mm-hmm. And and that's, that, that's a court case, right? I'm, right? I'm sure if you wanted to get the actual transcripts, you'd probably have to go to Archives 2 near Bernice because that's oh. a U.S. Civil Rights Commission case. Or you'd have to submit a request online like I did for the 632 cop- page copy of the FBI <laughs> file in order for you to get yeah. it. And they told me how many years they told me it's going to take. To, they told me it's going to take me two years for them to make the copy of that mm-hmm. file. And we so, was adding up all that money and here it was laid in our lap. Yeah, I mean, but, that, but that's the thing. Court yeah. cases are also like those digests are on Hathi Trust. Yes. That's, that's, yeah. They're also on there as well along with uh, Google Books. But check the county court, check the county website. Like literally just go to the county website. Don't assume that they ain't got no sense to be online. You might not have no sense to look to see that they already have been there. You just late. That I'm telling you, you I, matter of fact, make sure you guys tweet us a comment when you find out that the county is online and you didn't know they were. Um, but like I, like I said, I'm going to warn you, a lot of the major counties, because they have so many people coming in there, land speculators, people who are using this so they don't have to send a staff member out to go and do the field research online. That's really what it's for. But you're a researcher. You may not be doing airship searches. You may not be doing stuff for, for oil and land leases, but you are a researcher and this is public information. So you have access to this stuff. Um, so, uh, so we talked about, uh, and then state archives websites. Uh, Library of Virginia, I'm constantly shouting that out because those chancery court records are amazing and they index the name of enslaved people. Don't come for me about Louisiana. Please don't because I cannot help them. And I wish, Bernice, um, we, 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 got, we, got death, we got death indexes and marriage indexes online. We ain't got no court cases. Mississippi? No. <laughs> yeah. the, no. That's where the research uh, trip came in handy for me because it wasn't online and I had to go down there and look and pull them big gray metal boxes out and go through all of that when a person was invalid and they couldn't pay for their health back then or like how I found my grandmother in the insane registry and then that led me to okay she was in Mobile for those seven years and when was daddy going to tell me about that? Because I thought she was there for some other reason. Finally, he fessed up and I ended up ordering a death certificate and it just led to more and more records. But a lot of it for me in Alabama was being 
being there, but it's so much more online now. And it once I did that field work, then it was easier for me to go ahead and take a chance and just go ahead and navigate on the online of it. And that's what led me to these three major cases that I've been talking about all the time. My Hathi Trust, my um, Court of Appeals at the Supreme Court of Alabama, and the indictment from Illinois, and then my Chancery Records. So those are the three most important cases to me um, as I've been researching. And they were very intimidating, but you can get in there and get a lot of information. And it'll lead you, like Shelly says, one document is going to take you to another document, and that document is going to take you to another one. And Nika, I just want to say one thing about Louisiana. Check with all of the clerk of courts because Livingston Parish, there's a subscription service. And if you pay the money, then you can have access to some of the records, but it's worth paying to look and see than not doing it at all. So I, I think you should just first, as you mentioned, go to the different websites to see what's available online for your particular state and for your uh, jurisdiction. Yeah, and um, there's a chatter in the chat room. She said, um, and this is this, she mentioned that Louisiana has many newspapers that will get you started. Absolutely they do. And in some ways that may be a lead for you on your court research is because you'll find uh, the publishing of a notice about a court case, right? That may be your lead, but you still need to go locally to get the actual case information because that that little snippet in the newspaper, that legal notice is only going to tell you so much. It's not going to give you the full picture. Um, and I could just imagine, I think a good tangible example of this would be if True just saw one of those cases mentioned in the local paper, but she didn't pursue going and getting the original case, the course case documents. Um, and so, yeah, so she, uh, Fatima, I think her name is Fatima. It's no surprise, um, Fatima. I named the tooth fairy after you two weeks ago. You didn't know that. Um, she mentions also, uh, she talks about uh, also not a line, but in conveyance office, uh, our property sales, which include people. Exactly. But here's the thing. Some of these things are available. Some of these conveyances going up to usually the early teens and 20s in a lot of the parishes in Louisiana are available on family search for free, but you can't view them at home. You have to be in a family search library to view them unless you're able to go on site, which of course we can't do that because these offices and things are closed or you're trying to protect your immune system. So um, so we just wanna put that out there. So we're gonna show you a couple of examples of, um, of some court cases um, that we've come across that are not what you would consider typical, right? Because we've gotta sort of switch our frame of thinking. Stop thinking that pro and court records are just for, um, I'll say it, just for white people. Let's just call a spade a spade, right? Like we gonna call a spade a spade? Stop thinking the court records aren't for us um, because they are. And we'll have a little bit of a discussion about that after we get through uh, these documents. So Bernice, I'm gonna go ahead and share. This is the bottom of the document that you sent me. You wanna talk a little bit more about that? Okay, so let me give you all some background. My third great grandfather's name is Thomas Youngblood. In 1870, Thomas Youngblood was listed in the census as a farmer. In 1880, I found that he did own land. He was in the agriculture census, but he passed away. And there was a man in the parish of Livingston Parish, Louisiana, by the name of Robert Benefield. And he decided that he wanted to be appointed as the administrator of Thomas Youngblood's estate. And so I discovered a transaction as at least several court papers of which Thomas Youngblood's two sons, Lewis and Thomas Youngblood Jr. They put it, they hired a lawyer and they oppose the administration of Robert Benefield. The case, uh, it ended up with, of course, they, they, they won the case, but there were several different documents that I found to be extremely interesting. First of all, they indicated that Thomas Youngblood, the father, died two years ago. They named the wife, the petitioner's wife, uh, the mother of the two sons, Minerva Youngblood. She died five years ago. And this man, Robert Benefield, who was actually the editor of the newspaper in Livingston Parish, felt that he should 
for some reason, acquired the property of this family. And so when he testified, he said, well, uh, I have a bill for the estate, but the notary refused to make an inventory of the bill. Now, as you can see, all of this information is in cursive. I read the entire document and I actually transcribed it. He said that, wait a minute, the, the sons came in and said, we know of no debt. There's no debt for our, our father's estate. He has documentation where they actually went to various individuals and they paid the debt and it was well known in the community. So if you look at this document, you'll see that Thomas Benefil was actually denied being the administrator of the state and was found to be an intermeddler. I love that word, intermeddler. He had absolutely no rights to the secession of the property of Thomas Youngblood, and he was forced to pay all court fees. This was in 1883. And I was just so excited because this is not the first of documents that I found in the courthouse. I found a number of them. You may not think that your ancestors were paying attention to what was going on in their community. But what I discovered is that they were watching what the white people were doing and they did it too. They knew that they could go, they had rights and they knew how to hire lawyers and they knew how to present their case and they could win. And they, these two brothers did win the case. Mm, see, and look, and this is pre 1900. Let's That's just put right. that out there, right? This is pre-1900. These are people who are enacting their rights as citizens, full citizens of the United States, right? And here's the thing. I honestly think that that newspaper publisher thought they were too stupid and too intimidated by him to even challenge this case. And so, you know, and thankfully they had a decently progressive judge who <laughs> didn't rule against them be just because they were Black. Right. Like and, and we, we also we just can't make any assumptions. Right. We can't assume that our ancestors were in this like foothold of like white supremacy or like confederacy. Right. Because, you know, certain locations, even within a state that like completely was, you know, under the reign of the confederacy, maybe may have been more liberal during Reconstruction at a, at a certain point in time. Right. And so unless you know that history of that county, how they leaned, which way they went. Right. Even if it completely changed. You know, and Jim, when Jim Crow came down everywhere else, you still need to know what happened in that area. So I think you raised a very, very, um, you raised some very, very good points. Anything, um, Ellen and True, that you guys kind of, kind of see or I'm just, thought about? I'm really wondering, like, did he try that with other people, or did he Benefield try that with other people? Because as a newspaper editor, he would have been aware, and and I guess all everything would have crossed his desk. Oh, and girl, whether... say that. Wait, we got to pause on that now. Come on, come. This is why you tell the people what you're doing in your research, okay? This is why you don't sit in the silo on an island by yourself. Think about it. Legal notices, right? A county has an agreement with a certain newspaper within a certain location to publish legal notices because they, they fit certain standards. They are published a certain amount of times a month. The publisher has a certain number of uh, circulation, right? It's all these stipulations and that becomes the official organ. If the guy is the newspaper publisher, he's the one who is getting these notices that says lands are up for sale or there's this chance record case, right? Like they had to notify people, just like how we joked about them going into the church and saying five times or five different weeks that this man was going to marry this woman, right? Like that's what the old policy was. It's the same sort of practice that exists with these, with a death or with the probate, land sold for taxes, all that. It had to be printed in the newspaper well, usually three to five times. They'll tell you the weeks that it was done. So he knew that Thomas Youngblood was dead and he didn't think them black folks had enough sense to fight him. I bet, Bernice, well, you, got a, you got a rabbit hole a, project. It, <laughs> the dynamics are, are very interesting because the newspaper editor is in several of my family documents. Ooh. And so there's something going on in that relationship. I mean, other things did happen of which I won't discuss right now. Mm -hmm. One thing 
as you said. <laughs> You know, what was going on? What did that newspaper uh, editor to know? Yes, it was in the newspaper, but he knew them. Right. He yes. knew them. Okay. Right. I mean, I, I know that because I'm still finding his name in other family records. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, they, yeah, yeah, this is a good one. This That's a rabbit hole. If you like to join the Flights of Fancy Association that me and Angela and Shelly are part of to be a fourth co-president of the organization. This is one of those flights of fancy that we would take would be to see how many other cases around the same time that this guy filed. Right. And and were they all black people and you know where you could establish a burden of proof. Mm -hmm. I saw her eyes get real big. Ooh, I'm loving this. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is good. So I have an example of and I love pulling probates where nobody where the person wasn't dead. I love this because I it just I'm telling y'all, when I found the first one, I was like, she wasn't dead. And it was because she was a minor child. Mm -hmm. And so depending on how your state is organized, right? Mm -hmm. You, the, the equity cases or where there's land or property that belongs to somebody who's not the age of majority or not grown, so to speak, they might fall under, uh, under probate. And so I have an interesting example that I'm going to show everyone. Um, this is, it's noted in the United States Court for the Northern District of the Indian Territory at Vanita, which this, these records were in Nawada County, Oklahoma, but this particular uh, document was within the Nawada County records, even though it was in the United States Court for the Northern District of Indian Territory, right? Got to know your history. Why? Because this area was a Cherokee nation. And it talks about the matter of guardianship between Ethel J. Roy and Ray uh, Rogers as minors. And it's a petition for a guardian, right? So normally you're thinking, okay, a person just comes up, they say, I wanna be the guardian, that's it. But we get a lot of context on the lives of these children by just reading this petition for a guardianship. It mentions that the parents of the said minors who were Isaac and Sarah Rogers are both dead. That, war that the wards are citizens of the Cherokee nation and that petitioner Andy Fry is the maternal grandfather of the said ward. So we just got, three people in three different relationships in the first five lines of this document. That is a guardianship document. Then it mentions how old, uh, it mentions that the petitioner Leander Bean is an uncle. So there we got another relationship. Here's Ethel, she's 17 years old or thereabouts Roy is eight years old and Ray is 14. That no allotments have yet been selected for the said children. Wait a minute, allotments? Oh, but they're in the Cherokee nation? Wait a minute, that means land. So that means that their Dawes stuff had been applied for, but they didn't get to select the land that they wanted. And it most likely didn't happen because the parents had both died. So who was going to select the land? So then it goes on and it talks about the petitioner, Andy Fry, now has the oldest boy in his control and is supporting him and sending him to school in the colored school in Tahlequah. Petitioner Leander Bean has the youngest boy in his control and is supporting him. That neither of the petitioners have anything in their hands for support and maintenance of said wards. That petitioner Andy Fry also has the girl Ethel in his control and is supporting her. All of this in a petition for guardianship. Crazy, right? Like almost unbelievable. But here's the thing. This was in what is labeled probate. OK, so moving forward, here's another example of an actual probate that wasn't during what slavery. This is for a black man that died in 1922. And in this document, they're listing out his property. With a legal description where it is. Right. But here's the best part about this document is it lists all the heirs and their ages and their locations. So let's say maybe you had a, a issue where maybe a couple of names were garbled or you weren't sure where people were, right? You can affix that these people were living in Nowata mostly or Bartlesville, Oklahoma in 1922. And then we've got this nice notation here where it says Charles W. French, son of Clara French, deceased daughter of the above named decedent. So we get a grandchild, right? And that there's a, a preference that the said Rosie Rogers be appointed sole administrix of the estate of Rab Rogers. Well, here's here. Let's talk about this. You got signatures here at the bottom. The brothers ousted Rosie. They didn't think she was going to be a good administrator for the estate. So there are several papers that that 
go behind this or in front of this where they say, no, we don't think she's the right person. Someone else should do it. Now, I can't say if patriarchy was at work, but it might have been. So, yeah, go through the entire probate file. We talked about this before. Go through the entire court case before you rule things out and assume that nothing um, exists. Um, anything else you guys like to add, maybe with regard to what you saw in, a, in the documents that we presented today? I'm amazed because this is like, you don't even have a sense. So many people hung up on the census and then you get a document like this and it's not 1910, it's not 1920, 1922 and 1903. And you got like about 20 people on one document and you have, and also like a network of relationships that you really don't get a handle on until you really go through through there and you could see, and, and there are documents that you're not gonna necessarily find that elsewhere, that, the, that network of relationships too. It was yeah. really, really, really valuable. Go true. I was just going to say when I was following the chancery record after they got divorced, I wanted to know well, what happened to her and her baby. And she was still not claiming that she was divorced. Even on her death record, she was still claiming my grandfather as her spouse. And I just couldn't even go on with the baby, but I'll probably try and look into that more. But you know, even though they're not kin to me, you know, it le it led to other things like Ellen said, these names. And I wonder what their descendants are thinking that, oh, that man was supposed to be our pop pop. But, you know, this is the proof of what, why he's not, even though she's putting him still on other documents. So this may come back to me in, in other ways. Yeah. And I think this, I think this is a good time for us to also talk about the intimidation factor for some uh -huh. of this, right? We're walking into these locations, into these courthouses, really bold and expecting to be getting these documents. And sometimes we may be a little bit, you know, dismissive or judgy about our relatives that live there locally, who've never sought out to go to this location and to find this information. Let's have a conversation about that because I feel like, um, when you're removed from the ancestral location, like you don't have any direct connection to it, like in terms of like you were born there or you grew up there, you're a lot more bold to go and find these records. But the people who live there, they might not feel like they're allowed to even go in the courthouse and ask for some of this stuff. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Actually, when I found my, my records, records, I, I really, really don't, don't think any, any of my... Of my Family, family members who knew those, those records existed, and it may be because, because, because they were there. Were there. But, but I felt, I felt perfectly right. I would like to go, go in and look at those records. Bernice, hold on. You're a little garbled. Can you toggle your uh your uh? Yeah. Okay now. Yeah, pop, probably unplug your uh, headset and plug it back in because okay. it was a little bit garbled. Okay. But, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's better now. So yeah, mm -hmm. what you were saying, though, was that your family members were intimidated and they couldn't, I mean, I don't even think they realized the records were even there. Right. But mm -hmm. I felt it was in my right to go in and to to request those records and to start looking, especially since I had already done my homework as far as I could do it. And so when I got to my third great grandfather and I saw that he was a farmer and that he was on the agriculture census and I had his marriage record, there had to be more there. And so I, I said, you know, what do you have on Thomas Youngblood? And there was more information and I got it. Yeah, I, I think- He is not to be intimidated. The Come on now. To say, you have a right to go to the courthouse and, and request information or to inquire. Yes. About what your what trying to legal transactions they have on your ancestors. Yeah, and I I would I I'll, I'll also add in this too. When I first started doing research trips, you know, I always tell the story. My mom was like, "Why are you going? They don't have records on us." Like she flat out said that, and I was like, "Mom, like seriously." But I'll also say the first time I went to the clerk of court office and I was in there amongst the records, there was one black employee in the entire office. And, you know, when she knew we were coming in to look at our family history, she took us all the way to the back of the office. And she said, the records for the slaves, they're in the conveyance records. She had to whisper because the clerk had been there for 50 plus years and she didn't look like us. 
And so this employee who had been working at the office 20 years at that point, she did not feel empowered to verbally out loud share that information with us. That's how, and it's because she lived there, right? So she has an association. It's, you know, if you go poking around and looking at stuff, it's not as easy as I can just hop on a plane and leave. These, these people are there. This is their lives, right? So this is potentially risky for them. Um, and any wrong step, you step out of the box wrong even one time. It didn't take much. Go ahead, Ellen. You're muted. Sorry, let me unmute you. Go I'm ahead, Ellen. of Antoinette. Harrell, when she went and she that that documentary about her work and the people there, they would never. I couldn't imagine them going to the courthouse to try to dig up whatever happened. That would be so. That'd be really difficult. But it happened to me too. I'm sorry. No, it happened when I did my documentary there. You know, there were men that that came out on the corner there. And while we were filming in front of the courthouse just for intimidation. Um, another white lady, she threw her, her leg up on the, the street because it's kind of like you're up a little bit high off the street just to say, well, what are you doing here? And my cousin is a baby boomer. He was walking steps behind me with his wife. And um, James didn't say anything because he knows we, we, we have to get vouched for when when I started doing research in um, Bullock County, my aunt had to let the ladies at the courthouse know I was coming or if I came to talk to any elder in the family. But it was the same way with the records when I would go there. But that, that incident with me, with my filmmaker, she was from Chicago, she's Jewish. She was like, well, what did that mean, Truann? I said, I'll talk to you about it later. But she, it's been what, seven or eight years since I did that. And we still talk about what happened that day when we were filming, mm -hmm. how we weren't felt like we weren't supposed to be there, but I'm a northerner, I'm younger. And I'm like thinking it's none of your business while I'm here. I got, you know, I can do what I want. But, you know, when you're going in those spaces, I did learn that I had to kind of like, I felt like I needed to be small at times because you want to get to those records, but, and it was kind of intimidating, but then I was, you know, going through all these emotions where I need to get to my people. I have a right to go up to this courthouse, just like anybody else. Why does Aunt Sal have to call ahead of time for me mm -hmm. to say that, you know, my niece is coming, um, you know, true and don't come on a Tuesday because that's when everybody's up there doing their taxes or whatnot. And this is who you need to speak with. And, you know, that whole process. But now, you know, it's been a few years now and I'm used to it and I go without trepidation. But those first couple of years were, you know, were, were scary to me because you're going down south in the country. And my husband's like, I don't think you should be doing that. And, you know, don't be going at night. Well, the courthouse ain't open at night, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I felt like I sometimes I was like, you know, going back into the color purple and I was scared, but I was like, I got to go get granddaddy's paper, you Come know, on now. Mm -hmm. it was like, you know, he's a slave and he lost the first one and that white man right on the record and it's on there. I got proof of it. I could put it online, which it's probably is somewhere. But it says, now Mr. Ivory done asked me, this is his second time coming to ask me to come up to this courthouse to put this on record. He was actually so mad at Granddaddy Ike that he had to come back up there that he wrote it on the deed. So, and I, we already- <laughs> but It's because he got history. old and he didn't remember. And he where he had placed it. Exactly, he didn't know yeah. where it was. It's like my mama with a hundred spools of thread my sister just found because she moved. But it's I just say that to say, you know, it is intimidating researching while black. And it's like that when I go to a lot of spaces, even if I'm I'm a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, but I was still like, ooh, you know, I'm maybe me and Shelly were maybe the only two black people, women in there researching. And it's it's a lot, you know. Um, I don't think people realize that when we go in spaces where they think we're not supposed to be, but we are. We're U.S. citizens, and we have a right to do just like what everybody else does to, right. to get their records. Bernice? Yeah, I just want to say that I don't, I don't see anything wrong with doing some intelligence. That means finding somebody that you may want to go to that courthouse with. 
if you think you're going to be intimidated or you won't get what you want. I know the first time I went to the St. Helena Parish Courthouse uh, in Louisiana, I went with Antoinette Harrell because Antoinette knew the place. She knew we could walk right in the door. We even went into the vault. The, you can't go into the vault anymore. It is closed. And I was just there in February and things are very different. They've moved the tables. You have to stand up. Uh, you can walk in and say what you want. And if that person has time, they'll tell you what big conveyance books you need to look into. But always think that maybe you might want to go with somebody who can help you. Now, when I went to Livingston Parish, it was totally different. First of all, my mother went with me. And one of the things they said to me when we found a document we wanted, oh, well, you know, it's, it's in the basement and you need to come back with overalls. And I looked at my mother and my mother looked at me and we said, we can wait. <laughs> and then they brought the record. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to, to come in with your poker face and say, I'm here to get my record. I can't make another trip back. So I will wait and wait for your record because they will get that record for you, so. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it also goes to say too, you know, like that that one situation I just told you about where we had to go into the back of the courthouse and she had to whisper, she became the clerk of court. And so we just go and cut up in there now. Yeah. You yeah. know, we, we can talk we can talk openly, you know, I was like, hey, you know, when's the last time you saw that slave record? Girl, go over there and check it. So, so I get to stay during lunch. I don't have to leave. They let me stay an hour later if they stay, like, but it goes to say, it goes to show once you forge those relationships, you might want to find that one person that you really feel is kind of latched onto you and really wants to see you find something, connect with that person, you know, and even if the rest of the office is, is crazy, it's okay, right? You still have that one person. And then when you call back, or you could be like me and Miss B, when she finds something in her desk that she didn't know was there, girl, I found this big old package of cemetery uh, burials. It's like 300 pages. I don't know who else to send it to. You want me to send it to you? Miss Brock had it, the lady that made her whisper. She had it in her desk. I didn't even know it was here. So what did I do? I said, send it on. Digitized it, OCR'd it, and put it online. Because what was it going to do sitting in a, in a desk at the clerk of court's office? And it was burials in the parish going all the way up to 1985. Someone went out and surveyed wow. every cemetery. And, and including, they even went to the newspaper. So some of the barriers weren't even documented because the people had no headstones. They just got the obituaries and where they were being buried from the newspaper. So I'm telling you, it pays to know the people. Any final thoughts? Where do you go from here, right? Because I think court records could lead you in a number of different directions. It could show you that people had additional wives you didn't know they had or children they didn't know you had or uh, property records. It could, in Bernice's case, it could show you that someone may have been, the newspaper editor may have been acting with impropriety and may have been preying on black folks who, who did not know that he was doing this, right? It could be that you find out the reason why your uncle was, was prosecuted you know, by the state and, and killed by the state. It could be a number of different things, but I think court records in general, we need to just demystify them. We need to realize that unlike a census taking place every 10 years, court records happen every single day. And when you remove the blinders of, I can't find them on the census, you'll realize that you had an opportunity, right, for the court to document your folks. Something else I'll also add is don't just make it county court, city courts. Mm -hmm. There were city courts that exist and those records may not even have been kept by the clerk of court. They may be held with the town or the city recorder. I, once I got to those, I was like, look, I don't even have time because there ain't no index. Like it was like, nobody's coming to microfilm me. <laughs> like I was like, I just, that's, that's a down the line goal. Anything else you guys would like to talk about before we go into Ask Mariah? No? All right. You guys are quiet. So hopefully we pick, we think you guys have uh, picked up some stuff. It seems like we have um, in the chat room has been very, very active, um, which is great, which we love. Um, a lot of folks are sharing this episode because cl uh, clearly they're getting something from it. I would hope that they were. 
Um, but now it is time for your favorite, favorite part of Black Pro Gen Live. Ask Mariah. This is the part of the show where you, the viewer, submit your questions, queries, conundrums, and more to the panel. And we wait in live with research help specifically geared toward you. Panelists never see the queries beforehand unless you're Shelly Murphy. So you get a chance to see us work together live to help our Genia Buzz get past their brick walls. And I will have the panel know there are three slides for this Ask Mariah. That's a lot of information they sent. So they did information overkill, which is what we love. All right, so today's query is from Barbara Carter Trice. And she says, Caesar Wilkinson was born about 1824 in Virginia. He lived in the Carolinas in da and in Davidson County and Ruther Rutherford County. Um, and this is uh, in, I'm thinking this is North Carolina because she mentioned Carolina, but there's a Rutherford County, Tennessee as well. So she said he's found in Rutherford County in 1870 as in Carolinas. Uh, North Carolina. He died in Nashville, Davidson, Tennessee in 1903. He married Minerva Portillo in 1865 after the Civil War. They had two daughters, Betty Wilkinson Beard and Betsy, uh, as also known as Betsy, and Lucy Jane Wilkerson Miller. On Lucy Jane's death certificate, it listed her father as Caesar Wilkinson born in Lynchburg, Virginia. So we've got Caesar Wilkinson, born about 1824. He lived in the Carolinas and Davidson and Rutherford County. He's listed in Rutherford County in 1870, died in Nashville, Tennessee in 1903. I'll just call out because Nashville is a major metropolitan area. He did probably did have a death certificate um, because they had, um, you know, they major cities were doing them before smaller locations. Um, he married Minerva Portillo in 1865 after the Civil War. They had two daughters, Betty Wilkerson Beard, also known as Betsy and Lucy Jane Wilkerson Miller on Lucy Jane's death certificate. It lists her father as Caesar Wilkerson born in Lynchburg, Virginia. Caesar might've served in the Civil War as per the census. Hmm, didn't we do an episode where we mentioned that there was a column on the census that would tell you if somebody was a Confederate or Union veteran? So I would have to imagine that she means that it mentioned it on the 1910 census or maybe he was on the 1890 veteran census, right? He also has a Southern Claims Commission. You, do you notice how Bernice is on this panel and, and she's ticked off two of Bernice's favorite record sets? <laughs> he also has a Southern Claims Commission file in Tennessee where he filed for a payment of a horse and a sorrel, that's probably a sorrel mare, valued at $250. She says Caesar, Caesar Wilkinson's marriage certificate to Minerva, uh, Minerva Patillo is Rutherford. Now that's the thing. Now we've, we've gone from Rutherford County, North Carolina, to Rutherford County, Tennessee, right? And from what I remember, Nashville is sort of in the center of Tennessee. It's not bordering the northern part of the state or, you know, it's not bordering this area. Nashville is in middle Tennessee. It's not in East Tennessee, which borders North Carolina. So I have questions about these locations because they're kind of, they're a little bit all over the place. Um, his death certificate says he died in 1902 in Nashville. Well, that's a difference of a year, but that's not, that's really inconsequential. Also 1870 census where he is living in Rutherford County. There's a 70 year old man named William in his household. This particular census states that he was born in Tennessee. I'm just going to go with Rutherford County, Tennessee. I don't know if you guys have found, I, I know Ellen typically starts searching when we start pulling out this stuff. <laughs> so let me know, um, you know, uh, when and where you found stuff. So she's, she mentions this may have been a veteran of the Civil War, Southern Claims Commission. Uh, I think a timeline is definitely needed because of, and with location, so we know where folks are, whether it's Rutherford County, North Carolina, or Tennessee, um, or Davidson. Last slide, um, Caesar Wilkinson must have been a great man. There are five generations after him that are named Caesar. Two ancestors before him came to America with a white family and they were free. It is said that they intermarried with, with these people. Solving this will give us confirmation and understanding um, of the stories from Caesar Wilkinson's grandson, who is my grandfather. He told us about Caesar when the two freedmen came to America. They were, actually, they were already skilled. One was a blacksmith and one was a horse trainer. She's taken an ancestry DNA test. All right, so. So the, is the question, is she trying to confirm the oral history? It seems like it to me that she's trying to confirm the oral history, which kind of raises a couple flags. Why would white folks be traveling with black people and not enslave them? Um, if he's born in 1824, we have to assume his parents are probably born 18, 1804, early 1800s, which is prime time of the transatlantic slave trade. 
that's kind of an odd story that he was that these people you know two ancestors before him came to america with a white family and they were free that's a odd that's a little bit of an odd story that kind of goes against what we we know and what we've come across historically speaking mm -hmm. um but before we can even get to an origin story we got to go back these two slides <laughs> Please go back. <laughs> yeah, Ellen, um, did you, you said he's in Rutherford County, North Carolina? According to this, he lived in the Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he died in, in Nashville. In Nashville. Let me see that one. Yeah, uh, Angela's going back. She's like, what's the question? I think the question is yes, to I'm verify the, the oral history. <laughs> right. um, and she just put out what she has. Um, Dear Myrtle says, "Is where the was the white family quite were they Quakers? I mean, that's a possibility. Um, but I I think what is what I feel like is missing here is the analysis of the documents gathered, right? That will put him in the right place at the right time. Um, Ellen, where did you you said you found him in Rutherford County in um, 1870?" No, I, I mean, I just, just wanted to be sure that Rutherford County was in North Carolina. That's, there is a Rutherford County, but Rutherford County in Tennessee is, is Nashville. So that's kind of why I'm... Um, North Carolina? I think there is a Rutherford County, North yeah, Carolina. Yeah, there is in North Carolina. That's what it yeah. comes up with. Yeah. yeah. But we're not trying to re create her research journey. Right. No, but it's, right. it's like a so what for each of those yeah that, yeah and it's and i and i can hear i mean i can understand her looking at the name caesar and the the fact that there are caesars throughout the family but the point is if she's trying to confirm the oral history right who are the white family members mm -hmm. who, who are they find them find out where they came from and then see if you have a paper trail or some kind of document that shows these two African-Americans in the household with them or traveling with them. It's almost like you need to go and do another story or find some more information about them. Yeah, I'm thinking, um, it, yeah, it's Rutherford County, Tennessee, based off of what I just found. Really I found an 1870 and an 1880 census in Rutherford County. Um, Tennessee, which is Nashville, um, which which supports that death record, right? He's 47, um, born in 1823. Oh, okay. And there's the right. William yeah, Wilkinson right. that she mentioned in the household that's age 70. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, this is Murfreesboro. I know this area well, um, got a ton of family that lives there. And this is 1870. Remember, we don't have relationships to the head of household listed in this on this census, right? So you've got a 47 year old Caesar, um, his wife Minerva, and you've got several children. Um, and then you've got a 70 year old William, and then a Martha and an Amanda whose ages fall in between. Uh, you know, they may just be the oldest children. Right. Um, but there's no way for us to know who William is unless you vet additional documentation. I'm thinking maybe see if you can find a labor contract or some sort of Freedmen's Bureau records to, to, to vet that relationship if you're trying to find it. Um, on the rest of the page, looks like there's one white farmer named William maybe Barry. Ba Barry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe Barry. Uh, Taylor Beasley, another farmer on the same page. Um, I can't make out this last name. Haltman, maybe in a Pickett family. Um, looks like everyone on the whole page is born in Tennessee. So yeah, if I go back to uh, the 18. 80 census um, that has, yeah, so this one says Virginia, um, but same wife, still in Rutherford County, which is Murfreesboro, um, Tennessee, which is right outside of, you know, it's Nashville, basically Nashville proper. Um, and they've got one of the younger children. And then here are laborers in the household, which to me, if you've got this many people, right, you've got a daughter, a son, there's one laborer who's 15. And you've got a son, a daughter, a daughter, a son um, in the same household. You've got Virginia across the bat for him and mm -hmm. Tennessee for his wife, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, how do things change? Go back to William for a minute and see what it says about him. He was Tennessee because it was 1870 for that census. He was Tennessee? Yeah, because everyone on the whole page was born in Tennessee. In 1870? Yeah, the whole page. It could be an uncle. Oh, okay. Yeah, the whole page doesn't, his, he doesn't say Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I, I'm wondering, maybe it just got garbled. Ooh, malnutrition. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, city of Nashville, 1903. Mm -hmm. They have an exact birth date Mm -hmm. for him. He's married, so his wife didn't, she hadn't died. He died from old age, basically. Mm -hmm. And last residence, 52 and a half, Robertson Street, Nashville, Tennessee. Had been in Nashville for 50 years as of 1903. Wow. That's a lot of records for 50 years. She what do you mean that address i mean if he's at that say length of residence for 50 years that's saying based based on this math that's saying that he's been in nashville proper mm-hmm. since 1853 mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. so i don't think it's a matter because well, angela's you know about the southern claims commission what did it say uh she did not note what that said on something for him to file or he testified or he did something with that southern claim oh. you know i love those southern claims commission i do too and i'm i'm just trying to i think the question is um we're trying to i don't, I don't think it's a matter of like trying to verify her documents it's trying to kind of she, i think she's trying to verify the oral history oh, and to see yeah. if she can if she can do that yeah. Um, but you still got to reread all those documents the same way that Bernice was saying. You got to pull all that information out. Right. Something needs to trigger something in yeah. the documents. Yeah. Because it's not, because we've got Rutherford County. So that's correct based on when she's placed him in the census. Right. Um, it's got a petition. Mm-hmm. It says Caesar Wilkinson or Wilkinson who now resides three miles from Murfreesboro. So that's correct. That's corresponding with the 1870, 1880 census. Mm-hmm. He's a citizen, was loyal before the war, was the original owner of, and is now the sole owner. Um, let's see, what's the property? He's got the Sorrel Mare and a dark, uh, dark no, bay. The mm-hmm. 250. Yeah, mentioned. that's the $250. Okay. But typically, right, I'm still just browsing through here because it may be something- justified. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm. Witnesses, was William one of the witnesses for him? Yeah. That General Van Cleave, that's who he gave the uh, property to? Or that was, that took the property? Took the, who took the. um, Took the horses. Took the horses. Now here's the question. Here he is potentially an enslaved man. Whose horses were these? Were they his or were, you know what I mean? He's owning property, right? Look at his witnesses. I would check out those witnesses. I would too. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm big on that. Go and check out who are those witnesses. And then what did they say? What did they say? So we've got witnesses relied on. Looks like John Word, Word and, and Simeon Halliman. Now hold on. Did you Look guys remember? Witness. Yeah. Hold on. Let's go back to this 1870. There were people in this household up That's here right. with the last name Haltiman. Hal- they Hal- are. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Simon. Mm-hmm. Is there a Simon? I don't see a Simon, no. but is Simon connected? There's no coincidence that the surname is so similar between these people because this is 1873 and this is 1870. It's just a few years later. That's right. Right. Then we've got John Wood or Word and William Lillard. And that's it. There's nothing else on the document? Nothing. I've, I've gone through the whole thing. It was five pages. Well, still go back and research who are those witnesses. I would too. Um, I, cause, and here's the thing, people are probably wondering, well, what does, what is, what, of what consequence does this have to do with, with her question? She's trying to research this oral history and it has everything to do with it because how do you get back to this story 
of these skilled workers being brought on this boat with white folks that they intermarried with, but you can't make a connection from your ancestors during reconstruction to slavery. We have nothing. All we have is hearsay. 1823 to 1824, maybe 1826, he's born in what, Virginia or Tennessee? We don't know because we've got two documents that say Virginia and we've got one that says Tennessee. There's a lot of vetting and a lot of analysis on documents that needs to happen. This is, this is where you separate yourself from people who just collect names and collect information is when you do the synthesis and when you do the analysis of the documents. Okay, yes, it says that, but how, you know, you can't make a jump like that. That's like saying, oh yeah, well, my DNA says it goes back to Benin. So I'm from Benin. Well, who was the person in Benin? Who was it? Hmm. Some people might be fine with just Benin, but I want to know who the person is. So I'm going to do my due diligence to try to make, try to figure out who it is. But when you just rely on just what it says versus really vetting the information, I scrolled down on that death certificate because I wanted to know who's the informant. Who gave, who said he was born in Virginia on this particular day? They said he was living in Nashville for 50 years. Well, that's prop, that's not possible because we just found him in 1870 and 1880 living in Murfreesboro, which is technically not Nashville. Mm. So yeah. And Shelly's in the chat room that saying, so what, timeline. so what, so what, so what, so what, so what? <laughs> that's Shelly in the, in the chat <laughs> We just need a, 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 a slide just for that. <laughs> we really do. We really and do. yeah, yeah I, I think in this scenario, I think we mm -hmm. have to give her her credit because she has done the work that she needs to do. But um, the, the other thing I think I will check before we hop off is the Civil War um, pension cards um, to see, because here's the thing. If he lived until 1903, if he knew a Southern Claims Commission existed, if he was in the Civil War, he probably applied for a pension, right? Not saying that he did, but do, how do we know that the Caesar Wilkerson that you found with pension records is your Caesar Wilkerson? How do we know that? Have you looked into the regiment that is listed on the pension card or associated with him to see where it was organized, where they mustered out, if they were near Murfreesboro or Rutherford County or Nashville, right? Mm -hmm. Then that would make sense. But how you really don't know if it's him until you order the file and then it okay let's say there's a widow's pension exactly you know what was the was the wife still alive her did name was apply? unusual too yeah, yeah. so did she uh, apply for a widow's pension upon his death and then she had to then go and get witnesses to say yes she was married to him how long and everything that you need to know about proof what documentation did she provide to prove that she was the wife of Caesar Wilkerson, the man who was in the military? Yeah. And I, I'm just browsing just to see if I can find anyone with his name with a pension card and no. mm, 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 unless it's maybe the 1890 census said that he was in the Civil War? She didn't say which census she I found. I did see that name on an 1890, 1890, but we didn't click it on. When you were doing the yeah. census, there his name was there underneath. But we, like you said, if is that him on that veteran schedule? But a name for him did pop up on that. I just didn't click it. Now, and here's the, here's the issue with this. Mm -hmm. This Caesar Wilkerson that's on this veteran census is in, that, is in Memphis. Mm -hmm. that's two hours away mm -hmm. now that's not saying that it couldn't be him but we've already had him in 1870 documented in murfreesboro 1880 documented in murfreesboro 1873 southern claims commission documented in murfreesboro so are you telling me without cars that he went from middle tennessee to east to west tennessee two plus hours away right and U.S. color, they don't even, maybe it's a, it's USCT 59th Regiment. Where was that organized? And, 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 and based on his death certificate, he was supposed to be in Nashville at this point. So what would he be doing in Memphis? Enumerated on the 1890 veteran schedule. Hmm. Yeah, um, Jordan's got a great suggestion in the chat room, you know, clustering, um, doing some clustering on her on her DNA to see if she can track down 
folks um, who might, who have Virginia's root, who have Virginia roots, then maybe figure out who the white folks are. But to me, that's a second step because you still need the paper trail to support your research. That was too big of a jump for me. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah. Um, the only other thing I can think of is, you know, this is, we're taking you through the process. Where is the 59th Regiment of the USCT? Hmm. And naturally, I usually go to uh, the National Park Service site. <laughs> and I'm not seeing it. Probably spelled it wrong. Let's see. What you saying, Benny? Hmm. Memphis. It's a Memphis. It's a Memphis regiment. Okay. Mustered out. Yeah, they were pretty much in West Tennessee. So I, I, and he was a little old to be in the Civil War, to be honest. Born in 1824. It's not impossible, but considering location and his age. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just not looking like that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, um, yeah, we're just asking questions. And that's the thing. That's what's going to get you directly to the answers that you're seeking, which is what I think is to try to verify the oral history for your family. And the only way that you can do that successfully is if you ask questions of the documents that you're getting. And you need to vet every single piece of information on there, right? And just how you saw us connecting facts, right? He's in allegedly in Nashville since 1853. How is he mustering into a unit that um, was organized in 1864, two hours east or west of where he's living? when every other thing has placed him in middle Tennessee, that's a little far fetched. Now, when you start talking slavery era and him being brought to the state of Tennessee, something you can do in this instance is look to see if you can find a large group of, of, of white immigrant folks who left Virginia and moved into Murfreesboro to see if there was a big migrational component that happened. Like Bernice talked about on her show the other day about Bernie County, um, was it North Carolina? North Carolina. And the, yeah. Mississippi. To right. Madison County, Mississippi. See if you can, you know, find those county histories where it talks about those folks coming from those specific counties or specific regions in a location. And that may get you back to those folks who were on that boat. But just kind of throwing out documents and just kind of, oh, well, this looks like this sticks. No, you've got to ask questions. And this is why the, the analysis part is such, um, is such a big part. Anything else you guys want to add? Um, well, I just want to add timeline. You know, mm -hmm. just put, put together a full timeline so that you're tracking him as far as you can. And then you start asking the questions of what's missing between each of those timeline, time periods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angela chimes in. She says that the 59th never left uh, West Tennessee. So it's not like, oh, maybe they mustered out and that. No, that didn't happen. So I, my money is on this is not your Caesar Wilkinson. It may be, may, might be, maybe it's a relative, but it's not your particular one. Um, and then, like I said, asking questions of your documents, doing the analysis. Um, and, and the fact that he had these two horses that were taken by the government, have you checked local deeds in that area mm -hmm. to find out, right? Because if he had wherewithal to own, um, you know, property that was confiscated by the U.S. government as a slave, he had two horses that were taken away or soon during Reconstruction, He's doing something. He might be in some deed records or he might be in some court records. Have you checked locally? Cause that may actually lay out some of the timeline as well. That's true. Um, yeah. Cause to, cause to me that's think about, think about how, think about it. Normally in Southern claims commission, who are we normally finding in Southern claims? Like who's getting the money? What it's people? us. Exactly. It's <laughs> us this much. Bernice, like we getting a little bit <laughs> that, that much, right? We get that much. But 90% of the funds did not go to us. So the fact that he may have been paid out or they may have dismissed his claim because you didn't see any additional paperwork where the affidavits were in there for the people. But for him to have the audacity to come forth and say that he owns this property, I'd be looking for deeds. That's right. Mm -hmm. If it were me. So um, yeah. So Angela, she's saying, did the Southern claims reflect that? It didn't seem like it was paid out because I didn't see, normally you see that ledger that says that we paid we paid so and so. Yeah, but it didn't say it was rejected either. It didn't. So, oh, yeah. You know, unless it was barred. Exactly. Which it didn't Something come up in that. From that Southern Claims file. Yeah. There should be more, that there that, that should be evidence to support the fact that he owned those horses. Mm hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Narrative. (laughs) Exactly. There's no additional narrative associated. Well, Barbara, thank you for subjecting yourself and your research to uh, our panel (laughs) for uh, for scrutiny, I guess you would say, or just for assistance for you. Um, If you are like Barbara and you need help with your family history research, submit to Black Pro Gen Lives. Ask Mariah for a chance to have experts weigh in to get you past your research, your genealogy research hurdles. A link to submit is in the description of each and every episode. Remember to be super specific. Barbara did an excellent job laying out documents for us to be able to find what she found. Thankfully, um, that is, that's always best. We want information overkill. Um, because then that way we're not asking questions and be very specific about your question. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to verify oral history or are you trying to prove your mom wrong? Cause she said that Caesar Wilkinson was a King and he came over with Shaka Zulu. I don't know. Whatever you're trying to verify, <laughs> be clear, right? Let us know if you DNA tested the oral history you have, the more you tell us, the better you just may be selected for one of our future upcoming episodes. Want to remind you about our Friday check-ins called Roots and Chill. This is our way to keep you off the streets and potentially getting affected with coronavirus. Hopefully you have joined us. We are on week seven. We are focusing on the Civil War and Freedom Era. No coincidence that that was what we just spent a lot of time talking about just now with Ask Mariah. We've got a thread that's on Twitter as well as a pinned post on Facebook that kind of guides you into certain records that you can look into, gives you, you know, different tips and tricks and things to consider in your research that are based on the theme that we have selected. We've got one more week of Roots and Chill left, so you may, you know, you may want to get in where you fit in before time runs out. Don't miss our next crew chat taking place on Tuesday, May 5th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be talking about Daughters of the Dust from 1991 from a genealogy and family history viewpoint. Be sure to follow us at Black Pro Gen on Twitter to get the prompts, of course, and be sure to follow the official hashtag crew chat. Now, if you've never participated in crew chat, boy, you are missing it. Crew chat is so much fun. It's our Twitter chat. We think of questions. We always rewatch the movies and we pay attention to absolutely everything that could be of any sort of learning for you as a genealogist. So be sure to check out Daughters of the Dust. I can't remember which uh, service it's on right now. I just have it on my DVR so I can go back and watch it so we can create our questions. So be sure to join us on Tuesday, May 5th on Twitter, 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Our next live episode in the third episode of our Dawn of a New Decade series, learn the ins and outs of two censuses that cover the beginnings of the Great Migration into the economic downturn known as the Depression. Be sure to subscribe and set your reminders for The Count behind the 1920 and 1930 U.S. Census airing live Tuesday, May 12th, 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Want to go ahead and just say thank you to our illustrious panelists who came out, all the glasses wet lady wearing in the house, Thank you very much, Glasses Ladies, for your input and for your insight. Thank you, Barbara, for your submission on uh, for Ask Mariah. Don't forget to check us out this Friday for Roots and Chill, and we hope you have an amazing week. God bless. Thank God we're here. Um, we're still alive, and you're still getting genealogy content. We love you. Have a great day. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen, Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen. Black Pro Gen. The place where evidence tells the stories.